Welcome to the fifth part of this lecture on the Carnot map, the K map. The K map is a collection of squares where each square represents a min term, and this collection of squares is a graphical representation of the Boolean function. The way the K map is drawn means that adjacent squares only differ in value of one variable, a little bit like when we had the gray code, and then we need to recognize the patterns in the squares so that we can come up with alternative algebraic expressions. The K-map is actually a reorganized version of the truth table, and you'll see that from the index numbering, and it's what's called a topological warped Venn diagram. So the K-map has a number of different uses. It provides us a means for finding the optimal or a near optimum sum of products or product of some standard forms, a near optimum, two level, and or, and or, and circuit implementations, where the functions only have a small number of variables. It allows us to visualize concepts relating to the manipulation of the Boolean expressions. We can use it to demonstrate the concepts used by computer-aided design programs that simplify large circuits. The most simple case of the Carnot map is a two-variable Carnot map. And have a look at the indexes here. So we have the y equaling 0 and 1, x equaling 0 and 1 on the left-hand side. Then we have the indexes of min term 0, min term 1, min term 2 and min term 3. Between any min term, say for example min term 0 and min term 2, then it just differs by x, x changes from 0 to 1. Min term 2 and 3, they differ by y, which changes from 0 to 1. Min term 1 to 3 differs again by x going from not x to x. This shows the difference between the K-map and the truth tables. The K-map is just a different form of that truth table and written in such a way that we have more than one dimension here rather than just one big list of the input variables and then the output variables. We actually have this table format or this map format. Given a function of x and y, which is equal to x, so the function is true when x is true, then we can write this into the table form when x equals to 1. We have 1s here and here, and we have zeros here and here. And this could be written in two ways. First of all, we could write out the min terms. We could write out min term 2 and min term 3. But we can also recognize that there's a group here, which is just simply x equaling to 1, that's also true. We could do this with the minimization theorem by saying min term 2 plus min term 3 and then take out the x so that we can get this and equaling to x. Uh, but this drawing of on the k-map is actually a simple way to minimize this function. So here is another example of a function g. And then if we write out from the truth table where this is true, it's true when x is true, which is here and here and when y is true, which is here and here. This is min term 1, min term 2, min term 3. And we could also group these together in this way. This is x and not y, or x and y, and then this one is not x and y, or x and y. And we can also see here that this term and this term is doubled up. We don't need to have it twice. And we could optimize that in the normal way to get x or y. But the real point here is the ability to be able to circle groups on the k-map. Once we get to the three variable k-map, this is when things start to get more interesting. It's important to remember the location of the indices. Notice how it's not a straight count of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but actually 0, 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, 7, 6. And this is because of adjacent cells only differing by one bit at a time. Whereas if we wrote this so that it went 0, 1, 2, 3, then we would have 1, 0 and 1, 1. And we would have these adjacent cells differing by both the first and the second bit which is not what we want. We want it to just differ by one. So in this case, it differs by the y, which changes from not y to y here, and the z stays the same. And then also between here and here, we have y staying the same, y being true, and then z going from z to not z. So there's just a change in one bit. Here, 
the min terms have been written out completely. If the binary values for the indexes differ by just one bit position, the min terms are adjacent on this k-map. This slide shows an alternative way of labeling the sides of the map, and it may give you a quick insight into why we are laying it out in this way. Remembering that with a Kano map, we are reading off the product terms from the map after we've entered each of the ones into the map. Imagine then if we had min terms 1, 3, 5, and 7, so ones all through here, and then you can see if you were able to draw around this, then this is the same as z if all of these were 0, but everything here and here is y not, so y is equal to 0, and everything here is y is equal to 1. And then on the bottom side, everything in these middle two is when z is equal to 1, and then on the outside is when z is equal to 0. So z is equal to 1, z is equal to 1 on this, this inside part. By convention, although in truth tables we used to write when f equals to 0 as well as when f equals to 1, with Kano maps we only write where f is equal to 1, and then we leave out the min terms where f complement as in where we would usually write a zero. An example is this, for min terms 2, 3, 4, 5, remembering these are the indexes, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we write the ones in there, and we don't write anything in the other. And here's another example for min terms 3, 4, 6, 7. So 3, 4, 6, and 7 all have ones in them, all the others have nothing in them. So once again, I have to say, it's really important that you learn where these indices are, and I find if you need a little bit of a reminder, just make sure that between consecutive rows or columns, then it's only one bit that's changing. And then you can work out what that number is. 0, 1, 1 is 3. 0, 1, 0 is 2. We always write the most significant bit on the left-hand side and the least significant bits on the top. And here's the key as to why k-maps are so useful. It's by combining the squares, not just listing out the individual min terms, but actually seeing that we can combine them in order to reduce the number of literals into a product term. So obviously on a three variable k-map, one square represents a min term with three variables, and two adjacent squares represents a product term with two variables. So we've been able to get rid of one of the variables because it doesn't stay the same across those two and we can join them up in adjacent squares. Four adjacent squares is better than two. We would always use four if we possibly could. This is a product term with just one variable. And eight adjacent terms is where there's no variables since they're all just equal to one. If no matter the value of x, y, and z, the truth table had ones all through it, then you could circle all eight of them and just say one. So let's do an example here. We've got the min terms two, three, six, seven. So we've written out ones in the squares that have the indexes 2, 3, 6, 7. We could apply the minimization theorem three times, and here is the list of the min terms, just right here to make it a little bit easier. So this one corresponds to 0, 1, 1, it's the third min term. This one corresponds to 1, 1, 1, it's the seventh min term. So we could do some Boolean algebra, use the minimization theorem, reduce it, reduce it down to this one literal. We can also notice that it forms this two by two square. We could put a square around this and then have a look what's the same with this square. So Z, well, Z's changing. Sometimes Z's are ones here and they're zeros here. X's, well, they're changing. They're going between zero and one on here. Whereas Y, Y is actually staying as one. Just drawing a square around there tells us that we can just simply write y straight away. We don't have to do this minimization. More formally, for three variable maps, we can say that the reduced literal product terms for sum of products standard form corresponds to rectangles on the k map, and they contain cell counts that are powers of two. You'll either have one, two, four, eight, and you won't have a rectangle that goes around three terms or five terms. Rectangles of two cells represent two adjacent min terms, four cells represent four min terms, and they form what's called pairwise adjacent ring. And you'll also see that the rectangles can span to the other side of the rectangle so that they may not appear to be adjacent, but actually they are still adjacent because there's only one bit changing between the adjacent cells. And you'll see that when we draw that later on. Here are some shapes of two cell rectangles. 
So what does that give you? Z's changing, X is staying the same, Y is staying the same. So then you've got not Y and not X. Here's another one. We've got X changing, we've got Z staying the same, and we've got Y staying the same. So this is where Z is true and Y is true. Here's another one. And actually notice how this cell and the cell on the far left hand side are actually adjacent. It's as if you could wrap it around. So min term 0 and min term 2 are adjacent. We can notice that Y is changing, Z is not changing, Z is Z complement, and X is not changing. So we've got now here's some shapes with four cell rectangles. With the two cell rectangles, we always had two variables. With the four cell rectangles, you'll notice we'll only have one variable. Let's have a look at this. We can see that Z is changing, X is changing, Y is not changing. Y is constantly not Y. So that rectangle represents not Y. For this next one, we've got X changing, Y changing, and Z is just Z. So this rectangle represents Z. Another one which wraps around the outside, 2, 0, 6, and 4, all four of these terms, so not Z. Now we get into the more interesting ones where we get up to four variable maps. Before we just had X, Y, Z, now we've got W, X, Y, and Z. And the order in which they are written into this map looks like this, W, X, Y, and Z. In the same way as before, you could, you could write them out like this. And in this way, your W, X, Y, and Z binary value will give you these indices. And each time between adjacent squares, we're only changing by one bit. So in this case, it's the Y value that's changing. In this case, it's the Z value that's changing. Here, it's the X value that's changing. And then here, it's the W value that's changing. Four variable maps have rectangles that correspond to a single that contains all four variables, twos that have three variables, four ones together have two variables, eight ones together have one variable, and 16 ones would be zero variables, simply constant of one. So here are some examples of some shapes. We've got this one. We can notice that the Y is changing, the W is changing, but the Z is staying the same and the X is staying the same. So we can write this as x, z. Another 2 by 2 where we've got x changing, we've got z changing, but y and w, let's write not w there, is staying the same. So we will write this as not w, y. Now here's an interesting one. What we saw previously for the 2 by 1 map was that we could actually wrap it around from left to right or from top to bottom. So here you can notice that you can wrap it around just the corners, 0, 2, 8, and 10 in this case. And we can see that the W is changing because we've got not W up here and W down there. And the Y is changing. We've got some over here that are Y equaling 1 and Y equaling 0 over here. But the Z is staying the same. The Z is not Z for both sides here. And the X is staying the same. It's also not X. So we'll write not X and not Z. So here's some more shapes of rectangles. We have 2 by 4 rectangles. X changing, we have Z changing all the way across the board, we have Y is changing, but the thing that's not changing is W. This is all not W's. Here's another one. W, Y, and Z are all changing, but X is staying the same. It's just purely X, so we can write X. Here we've got X, W, Z all changing, but Y is staying the same. Y is not Y. Here we've got W, X, Y all changing and Z is staying the same. We write Z. And here we've got it wrapping from the top to the bottom. And this is the case where all of these values are X not. Wrapping around the outside. So this one we've got W, X and Y all changing, but Z is not changing. And this is not Z on both sides there. So that's not Z. So now let's do a four variable map simplification. So here are the min terms, 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 13, and 15. So let's write them in. All right, so can we draw any 16s? No. Can we draw any 8s? No. Can we draw any 4s? We can draw the corners. That is where not Z and not X is. So let's write out F equals not X, not Z. So there's another 4 here. This is where X is true, Z is changing, Y is changing, W is not changing. 
not W and X. You can draw another four here, and this is where Z is staying the same and X is staying the same. So we have X, Z. So is it that? No, one of those. So notice here how there's two solutions. This is the one that we originally got. This is another valid solution. The difference between the solution that was given and the solution, this solution, is that this is grouping the not Z and the not W together. So that would be a grouping like this, which is just as good as doing a grouping like this to cover these particular min terms. This one and this one's already covered by not X and not Z, and the middle ones are already covered by the X and Z, which is common between the two. And it's just a question of how to cover these little guys here, and they could be covered with this four grouping or the four grouping there. So both of them are valid solutions. Let's do another four variable map simplification. Here we have the function, and here we have the list of min terms, so we can write ones wherever there's a min term. We're going to look for groupings. So first of all, we can't find a 16. There's also no eights that we can do, but there is a four, there's a two by two here, and that is X, Z. And then we can't find any more fours, but we can find some two by ones. And this one is Y is staying the same, Z staying the same, W staying the same, and another rectangle here. And this one, X, Y, and W are all staying the same. In this one, we've got W, Z, and Y all staying the same. And finally here, where X is staying the same, W is staying the same, and Y is staying the same. However, something else we can notice is that this two by two in the middle, although we're always trying to include the largest sized rectangles, whether that's there or not, we would still have covered these ones in the center. And that's because in order to cover these outside ones, we've needed to draw these two by ones which is these four terms, and it means that this X and Z term here is no longer necessary. So we wouldn't include that in the solution, and the solution is just these four terms. So that's good, that's the solution we got. The prime implicant is a product term obtained by combining the maximum possible number of adjacent squares in the map into a rectangle. That's what we were trying to do before with the number of squares as a power of two. The prime implicant is called the essential prime implicant if it is the only prime implicant that covers and includes one or more min terms. So that was what I was showing in the previous example where we had a prime implicant that wasn't an essential prime implicant, the XZ term, we could remove it. And we use the K-map in order to determine which are the prime implicants and which are the essential prime implicants. We can say in general that a set of prime implicants covers all the min terms if for each min term of the function at least one prime implicant includes the min term. So in this example we've got to find all of the prime implicants. We've got a function of a, b, c, d. We'll once again try and put a rectangle around 16s. There's no 16s. And then 8s. There's no 8s. Then 4s. So we can have a 4 with the corners. And this is b and d is not changing. Then another 4 here where A is not changing and B is not changing. And then another four, whoops, here, where D and C is not changing. And then another four here, where B and D is not changing. We could draw another square around there, which is A and D. Another square around here, which is not B and C. But you can see here that actually we're starting to have some overlap and certain terms obviously not going to be needed despite all being prime implicants. And that's probably all the ways that we can draw two by twos drawn a little bit more cleanly. So you've got your BD, you've got your CD, you've got your AD, you've got your A and not B, you've got your not B and C, you've got your not B and not D. So then we have to think about which ones are the essential prime implicants. And obviously they're the ones where there is no overlap. So there's overlap on these ones, these ones. But this particular square here, this particular min term here, isn't covered by any other prime implicant, and the same as this one's not covered. So therefore those two, which is BD and not BD, are going to be the essential prime implicants. So BD and not B and not D. We must have them, and these are known as the essential prime implicants. And then the others, there can be various solutions, but however we need to cover these last three using whatever combination of these prime implicants.
So finding all the prime implicants for this function, the min terms already drawn out in the correct indexes. Once again, we go looking for a 16. We can't find a 16, but we can find a two by four and eight. So we're definitely gonna have that one. This is A. Then we don't have any more eights, but we have some fours. So here's a four, which is not B and not D. We have another four here, which is C and not B. And in that way, we've covered all of the ones. We don't need to have any more. We could have written other ones, but they would be not necessary. So that's right. Here is another example, another function G. These are the list of min terms. We've drawn them into the table. There's a hint given that there's seven prime implicants. We're gonna try and find them. So no 16, no eight that I can find. There's a four. There's no other fours that can be found. So this one is A and B. Now we have to find twos. So here's a two, there's another two. So here's another one. There are various ways that we can cover those in twos. And this is why we'll get up to seven prime implicants despite this being a valid solution. So here are some other prime implicants. Another one, there's another one. So these are the seven prime implicants. The essential prime implicant would be just the AB. These other ones are all interchangeable in some fashion, but we have seven prime implicants altogether. And there's the answer, which is the same as what we've got. So now we'll introduce don't cares into the KMAP. And these are really useful where sometimes the input value for the min term will never occur or the output value for the min term is never used. So in these cases, the output value doesn't need to be defined. It doesn't matter if it's a zero or a one, we don't care. And so instead of putting a one in there, we put this X meaning don't care. And this can sometimes or quite often actually allow us to make the logic circuit cost lower because we're able to group together multiple literals into product terms that cover a larger area of the KMAP. So here's an example where we would use don't cares and KMAPs. So in this example, we've got a logic function having the binary codes for the VCD digits as the inputs. So remembering binary code and decimal from lecture one. And let's think about where are the don't cares. So remembering that in BCD, we only have code from zero to nine. And then after that, we have another BCD digit. And so from 10 through to 15, we don't care. It's not gonna happen. So those six codes, which are 1010, which is for 10, all the way through to 1111, which is for 15, they'll never occur. And so the output values, we can simply say they're X. We don't care. Here's another example of don't cares in KMAPs. We have a circuit with two sets of input variables. The first set is ABC, which take on all possible combinations. That is, they can all be zeros and ones. And Y, which takes on values zero or one. We have a single output Z, and the circuit that receives the output Z is only for combinations of ABC when A is equal to one, B is equal to one, and C is equal to zero. Otherwise, we ignore it. So what we can see there is that no matter what the value of Y is, Y could be zero or one, and we don't care. Therefore, we could have a solution where A is equal to one, B is equal to one, C is equal to zero, and Y is equal to zero, and that would be a valid solution, or where Y is equal to one. So Z is specified only for those combinations, and for all of the combinations of A, B, and C, Z is don't care. Z must be specified for A and B, or not C, equals to one, and don't care for everything that's not that. That is, we negate that entire expression, then use De Morgan's theorem to expand it out, and end up with this, we have don't cares. Ultimately, each don't care entry may take on either a zero or a one, and an X may take on a value of zero in a sum of product solution and a value of one in a product of sum solution or vice versa. Also, it's important to note that these don't cares, that is any min term with a value of X, does not need to be covered by a prime implicant. We can actually ignore it if we want to. It's sometimes good to have it there in order to get a lower literal cost for the end solution but it does not need to be covered. So that's an important thing to remember. So here's an example. We've got a map 
given by the function f1, which is defined as five or more over bcd inputs. So we can see that we have values between zero and four being zeros, definitely zeros, then values five or more for bcd, which is five, six, seven, eight, nine, all being ones. And since it's bcd, there are no values of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, so we can put don't cares there. But if we were to try and solve this without the don't cares, assuming the don't cares were all zeros, then we wouldn't be able to draw such large rectangles around. So if we do that now, we have not w, x, and z. So not w, x, and z. This is this rectangle. Not w, x, and y. Not w, x, and y. This rectangle w not x and not y so that's here so in this case the gate cost is 3 6 9 10 11 12 so that's the gate cost 12 if we were not to use don't cares if we made sure we only covered the ones and none of the zeros or the don't cares However, if we take advantage of the fact that these don't cares don't matter, then we can actually draw an 8 here, which is W, and then we can draw an XZ, which is a 2 by 2, and then XY, XY. And so in this case, we've got a gate cost of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which is significantly lower than F2, where we didn't use the don't cares. Now we're going to do a product of sums example. Up till now we've been doing the sum of products. So we've been getting terms that are product terms and then summing them together. However, it's suggested that we use the F complement and then complement the result of that in order to get F. Let's write out what the min terms of F complement are. Remembering that the complement of a product of sums is equal to the sum of products. Okay, and let's write out the min terms onto this Carnot map. So 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. And then we're going to get the sum of products. We're going to see if we can get, there's no 16, there's no 8, but we've got 4 here, which is equal to not A, B, and then another 4 here, which is not B, not D. Okay, and then we're going to do the complement of F complement. If F complement is equal to this, then F is equal to so notice how we've taken F complement, we've swapped anywhere that there was a plus, we've put a dot, anywhere that there was a dot, we've put a plus, anywhere that was a negation, we've negated that, and then we've added negations wherever there wasn't one. And so this is the answer. Yep. In terms of the optimization algorithm, then we find all the prime implicants. We make sure we include all the essential prime implicants in the solution. And then we select a minimum cost set of the non-essential prime implicants that will cover all the min terms that are not yet covered by the essential prime implicants. And from that, we can obtain an optimum solution depending upon what it is we're trying to optimize for. In order to obtain a good simplified solution, we use the selection rule. The prime implicant selection rule says that we minimize the overlap among the prime implicants as much as possible. And in particular, in the final solution, we've got to make sure that each prime implicant selection includes at least one min term not included in any other prime implicant selection. Here is a selection rule example to simplify F, A, B, C, D given this K map. So we can't find any 16s, we can't find any eights, but we can find a four here. Then there are no other fours, but we've got a two here, another two here, another two here, another two here, and a two there. And so you can see that in terms of the essentials where min terms are only covered once, it's these ones that are ticked. All the other ones are covered by more than one prime implicant. The essential prime implicants, we need to have them. So we write those two first, and these are essential. And then we simply choose a few more from the remaining prime implicants so as to cover the remaining min terms. In this case, we can choose just those two because if we chose any of the others, then we would need to have more than two in order to cover all the min terms. Here's another selection rule example where we use don't cares this time. So you can see that the X's have been written in the don't cares. There's no 16s, there's no 8s. We can find a 4 here, and there's another 4 here with not AC. There's no more 4s, so we've got a 2 here, another 2 there, although you'll see that because that prime implicant is only covering don't cares, we won't need it. Another 2 here, 
there's another four there. So the ticks show where the min terms are covered by the essential prime implicants. They're obviously where rectangles are only covering that square once. So we definitely need to have that not a b in order to cover this set of min terms. You can see that it is advantageous for us to have these don't cares in this case. So if they were zeros, we wouldn't be able to draw such a large rectangle. Here is one of the ones we've selected, and there is another one that we've selected. And notice how we've selected the 2 by 2, which is not b and c, rather than selecting a smaller prime implicant that would only be 2 by 1. In terms of practical optimization, we often have the need to automate these optimization algorithms and we will require the min terms as the starting point. We require to determine all of the prime implicants and then some sort of selection process with a potentially very large number of candidate solutions to be found. The solution suboptimum algorithms not requiring any of the above in the general case. This seven segment display example will be one that you'll tackle as part of your assignment and it will be trying to turn a BCD input into a seven segment display decoder. There is another small video lecture discussing this in more detail.